Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, this live stream about digital transformation in the NHS. Um, I'm Ben Moody. I lead the Health and Social Care Programme at Tech UK. We're a trade body for the tech sector. So lots of members, uh, some of them represented here, and I hope many of you watching out there as well. Um, I was delighted to be asked by Sam Shaw uh, to chair this session uh, in Digital Leaders Week. Um, a bit about my background I was asked to give. So I really got into this game uh, over a decade ago, working for Accenture, who are now one of our members, on a project trying to turn x-rays and other digital images, uh, other images, digital. Um, after that, for my sins, I went to work for a politician. God forbid, they're not the most popular people at the moment. Um, and then worked very much at the patient side of things for Diabetes UK. Uh, and Macmillan campaigning for better access to technology. So I know some of the pain points that patients have or the public have um, in trying to get better access to digital tools. And we've got good representation on this panel and in those of you watching at home or from your office, um, from people who are clinicians, managers and others. So please do join in this panel. Uh, we're using Slido and if you put in the code NHS Stream, uh, you'll be able to ask questions that I will then put to our panellists. So it's a, a crucial juncture for technology in the NHS. NHS X launches in just a couple of weeks. We have a new vision. We, uh, I was saying we had uh, a new health secretary who's been in the post for less than a year. We might be getting another one soon. Who, who knows? Um, but with NHS X uh, due to launch and a lot of work going on there, it really does feel like this could be a new dawn for health technology. So that's my opening gambit. I will pass over to our panel now. Um, so without further ado, uh, if you don't mind, if each of you could introduce yourself, say a few words about your background, perhaps how you got into uh, health and health tech. Um, and then just a little bit about what you see as the barriers to this vision for a digitally enabled health and care service. Sam. Thank you, Ben. So uh, I'm Sam Shah, Director of Digital Development for NHSX. And firstly, really like to thank uh, Tech UK and Ben for uh, joining us on this panel during Digital Leaders Week and all my fellow panelists who have given up their time this afternoon to be here. I'm really grateful. And Digital Leaders Week is all very much about those things that we can do to improve leadership in digital services and improve tech for good across the system. And for me, that is a very big part of what it is that I do and the things that I'm involved in. So I am a clinician uh, by background, I still practice, but I'm also involved in the digital transformation of the NHS and have been doing that for some time. And I started off in a world which was involved in financial services technology, retail technology, and other areas of technology, which sort of drove me down this path. And I've seen the benefits of taking very much a data-driven approach to everything that's happened in every other sector to getting the benefits of digital transformation during the internet era. And for me in healthcare as a clinician, we see this every day where we may want data to make better decisions uh, when we're dealing with our patients, we may want data to help us make better management decisions or commissioning decisions. And at a system level, we might want data to help us make better decisions around those sorts of digital transformations that might take place. So I think there's a mixture of barriers and enablers. Some of them will be cultural, some of them might be regulatory, and others simply might be the maturity of the system as a whole. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Hi, my name is Michelle Interbrink. I'm a customer engineer with Google Cloud, uh, focusing primarily on public sector and healthcare here. Thank you very much for having us, and I'll also thank my other panelists, so thank you also for your time and expertise. Um, my background is that I spent about seven years working at a hospital in the United States doing healthcare delivery research, primarily focused on inpatient care and quality of care. And a lot of that was around quality improvement projects and um, things that would seem quite simple, how to expedite discharges, how to ensure good follow-up. Um, after finishing there, I spent a couple years as a consultant data scientist, and uh, now I'm here at Google. I think, from my perspective, something I saw, um, saw previously and I, I continue to see is that 
there are two components of tech as an enabler for healthcare. There's the sort of aspirational and very exciting application of machine learning AI in diagnosis, treatment, and management of disease. But I think there's a more foundational application of technology, which is primarily around enabling practitioners to better do their jobs, whether that's seeing patients, whether that's assigning operating theaters. I think the there's, a, there's still a barrier that is at the operational level uh, that prevents clinicians and other practitioners from having the information they need to do their work day to day. Um, so I think that is a great target for technology and, um, and some exciting stuff's already happening in the NHS. Thanks very much for having me, it's great to be here. My name is Jacob Turner, I'm a barrister based in the UK, and I'm also the author of a book called Robot Rules, Regulating Artificial Intelligence. This looks at why AI is unique from a legal and regulatory perspective, what problems it could cause, and how we can solve them. The book isn't just talking about healthcare or the NHS, it looks at the way that AI is used in all areas. Although in healthcare, AI is in some of its most advanced uses, so it's a great use case to identify and to explore some of the problems and some of the potential solutions. In terms of the challenges for the NHS, I think there are really two questions that need to be answered. Not so much in terms of the data per se, there is a lot of regulation of that, but particularly in the way that if we are going to allow algorithms to allow machine learning to make decisions based on data, there are two issues within that. How should AI take difficult decisions? And are there any decisions that AI should never be allowed to take for patients? We can certainly answer those questions, but until we answer them, there will be challenges for the NHS. Thank you. And I'm Anne Croft. I'm a commercial partner at DAC Beechcroft, and I have nearly 30 years experience advising NHS and private sector organisations on various commercial issues relating to health. So um, part of my job, I guess, is helping uh, NHS to implement policy. So we've seen the early days of implementation of EPR records through the National Programme for IT. More recently, of course, um, a lot of our work is around creating more collaborative uh, groupings such as integrated care systems and providers and helping those organisations come together, work together, and of course facilitate shared patient records. So a lot of our work is around helping create governance structures to enable organizations working together to make decisions about how patient data can be used. Uh, and that is quite challenging because it requires um, uh, bringing along a lot of stakeholders, uh, commissioners, providers, GPs, patients uh, and others, and making sure that there is appropriate transparency and most of all communication um, particularly with the public and patients, um, to ensure that we have consensus on how patient information should be used. I'm sure that's a topic we'll return to a few times in, in this discussion. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I'd just like to, to pick on Sam to begin with, just because of something you said in that intro. So coming from a, a background and a knowledge of you know, the way that tech has transformed retail, and the way that tech has transformed finance. Just because I'm very conscious we've got a mixed audience watching this. What is it, what's the crux of why the NHS has been such a laggard in this area? Why, why is it that when I get a doctor's appointment, even as someone who, dare I say, might be more digitally savvy than the average person, why am I still outside the surgery at 8.30 in the morning, queuing up in the cold with a lot of other sick people spreading germs amongst ourselves? So I guess I would start off by saying that perhaps the NHS isn't so much as a laggard, but perhaps has to take a more cautious approach to trying to implement some of these things, because ultimately we take safety, security, privacy, and quality of our service users, our patients, so seriously that that element of clinical safety is probably the first thing that comes along. And when we've got an organization, which isn't one thing, but made up of more than 22 and a half thousand different entities just in England, that's quite a different environment to, let's say, a big retailer or a big bank, which is a single entity for all intents and purposes. So it's a different set of dynamics. Each of those has its own governance. Each of those has its own responsibilities. And ultimately, each of those is responsible for the safety and the quality of the service it offers those patients. 
So we've got a different dynam dynamic to deal with, which is what is the evaluation of that technology? How is it that the data flows? And what do we do to ensure the privacy and the rights of the individuals whilst using that to try and change things? And if we take the example of a surgery, whether it's eight o'clock in the morning or any other time, they are having to deal with all the other things that they're doing, as well as that funnel of patients coming in. And this is where we need to use to both uh, the needs of our individuals that are using the system, as well as the opportunity of technology to change things. So maybe we need to focus more on the needs of our users, the three different types of need, before jumping to a technology solution. Yeah. Any, any more comments from the panel? Just comparing, I, I guess it's not the NHS per se, because health, uh, compared to other industries worldwide uh, is a less digitally intensive uh, field, or at least whilst there are pockets of you know, digitization and very kind of future-looking tech, it's not the case across the board. Whereas we've seen a more wholesale transformation in other industries. From your experience, either from the NHS or from other uh, geographies, um, what, what would you say are the reasons for that? Well, if I can comment, I think, following on from Sam, really, I mean, uh, it, it's a lot around transformational change. Um, and the interim workforce plan, um, which was published quite recently, did talk about the need to create new roles and the possibility of creating new roles through the use of digital technology. But that will take time and needs to be planned. Um, there are clearly um, opportunities for changing the way in which the NHS can work. Um, uh, through digital technology, but that also has implications for the way they use property um, as well. And uh, long term, you know, it may be an opportunity to use property in a different way. But at the moment, um, there are th there are a lot of issues around the state and condition and investment and so on. So there's a lot of change, I think, that needs to go alongside the adoption of technology, and that may be one of the reasons. And, and is there something in there in that if we focus on the problems that we know of right now in the system? that we could end up solving yesterday's problem. Whereas if we took a more of an enterprise approach, could it be that we solve tomorrow's problem or a future problem, which might require a different solution? And I guess if I think about some of the things that you're both involved in, they're much more future facing. And do we need a way to be more open to those other ideas that might not be immediately the things we think of? Any more comments? From... Um the NHS perspective, one of the things that uh, interests me in terms of the way that um, it might be seen to be uh, potentially a laggard is the way in which it has to deal with so many different constituent parts. It's not like a bank which might have to deal with a few different counterparties or a trading company. One has to deal with the public, and there are obviously public concerns in the way that technology is being used and there are certain novel questions which are now arising with the mass collection of data, big data sets, the use of AI in uh, the NHS which we've never had to deal with before and those raise major societal issues so it seems to me correct that the NHS should be taking a cautious approach but at the same time one doesn't want to abandon the opportunities that those technologies bring. And um, I guess if I could just speak personally, in, in my experience, um, so I'm from the United States, I recently moved here, I would say that in my experience as a patient, the NHS is in many ways quite advanced in terms of how it treats patients and how patients interact with the system. Um, I, I don't think it's the case that it is, for example, a laggard compared to the United States. I think my experience here is that then in many ways, uh, the flow of information is quite good and the system seems to be really focused around patient care, which is interesting and may explain why progress is slow, but I'm not sure if I would say that the NHS is especially uh, behind the times in technology. I think it may be a, a healthcare issue more than just a specific NHS issue. Yeah, and it's great to bring that international perspective. I, I find that in conversations we have, too often we can talk down the system that we have when if you actually skip the tech bit, which ultimately all of us are here because we care about better health and care, of which technology is a tool, to help us achieve that. The NHS, uh, you know, depending on which comparison you look at, comes out very favorably. It's not a bad country to get sick in. Um, one of the questions that's come up on Slido, um, I'll, I'll start with this one. So what in the panel's view can safely be automated in healthcare to take the pressure off the system? 
So any particular areas where you think there's um, greater utility for technology than others? So, so I guess from having spoken to lots of providers and lots of tech providers out there as well, uh, and thought about what some of the issues and the problems are, both in my own practice as well as elsewhere there, I think there are some easy things. For example, all the back office functions could largely be automated in some way. Uh, some of the other things we do, like staff and identity management uh, and validation of credentials, those things could be managed in a different way. And there are other things, like the way in which we deal with telephone calls across the system, booking through the system. These are all things that could be easily automated. I think the things that are more challenging to automate is where it comes into a decision being made that ordinarily it needs a human-to-human -human decision, where it's a clinician-patient interaction. I think those things are more difficult to automate. Sure. I think, okay. there are, so I, in, in my view, there are, on the one hand, the technological barriers to automation, making sure that, that the technology is sufficiently robust, sufficiently effective, that it will meet the minimum required safety standards. But then, even if you've met those requirements, there are then the psychological, the societal concerns that people may have. Even if a AI system is 95% accurate, whereas a doctor giving a human diagnosis is 90% accurate, people may still prefer to have a human doctor for the types of reasons that Sam was mentioning in terms of human interaction and human judgment. There are simply higher levels of trust at the moment for human decision making in certain areas. So solving the technological problems is, is one thing, but making sure that people trust those solutions is another related but separate issue. And, and is there something there about the sort of expectations from consumers out there, not just necessarily staff, but consumers as a whole? And if we take the degree of digital penetration in society and what people use digital and technology for, might that drive what they may expect from the health system? So out there, people might be very comfortable using technology to buy online and share their data and go shopping. It might be that they decide that in healthcare, because of how they perceive their problem, the way they might see their data being transferred, they might be more reluctant to use it in a way that would allow for automation to take place. And, and I don't know what the uh, sort of situation is in other industries and uh, if there's any comparison on the way that data is shared to drive that automation from other part of other sectors that's come about. I mean, I think you, you hit a couple of things right on the head, which are there are things which are already being successfully automated, I think, that improve patient care. So when you look at things like booking systems, anything that doesn't require clinical expertise is potentially a target. But, you know, the other the other thing to keep in mind, of course, is that those things should always be tested. They should be carefully rolled out. They should be monitored. Um, and I would say that there's potentially a, a there's an option for not full automation, but what we would consider something like clinical decision support. So not automating a diagnosis, but providing guidance around it. Um, I think those are probably in the near term uh, much much safer and more reasonable targets. And I think where we see, uh, or at least where I've seen a lot of innovation happening. One of the challenges there around that automation piece is how do you get the right scale to drive the benefit that justifies the cost and expenditure? Because we could probably automate lots of different things. And I guess in the new world is how do we bring together enough different providers that have got enough scale between them to make that automation beneficial to them? Now, in some cases, a big trust, it might be much easier. But I can certainly imagine where we've got lots of smaller providers like uh, in primary care, that might be more difficult because they're not used to working in that way at scale. And I wonder if there's anything that's emerging from the work on uh, networks and systems that's coming out from your work, Anne. Well, well, certainly. I mean, you, you, there is a point there around what I was saying earlier. How do you get a governance and decision-making framework in place to enable uh, GPs, for example, to both have a voice and also collaborate and participate uh, and not feel that they're sort of dragged along by more influential and bigger organisations? But just to come back to something you were saying before, which is about, um, you know, some of the reasons why the adoption of um, AI, in particular automation in health, is perhaps slow. So there's some interesting findings coming out of the work, for example, that the National Data Data Guardian is doing um, around, you know, what the public and patients reasonably expect their data to be used. Um, and uh, some of those findings are that um, uh, the public can be quite comfortable with their data being used by the NHS, 
for a particular purpose, but not comfortable with a commercial organisation doing the same thing. So that's clearly um, a dialogue that needs to be had, and, and part of the National Data Guardian's work is in exploring and trying to get some more consensus, a compact with the public, if you like, uh, about what appropriate uses and collaboration with, the, um, with industry looks like and would be using their data. So I think this is perhaps a complicating factor. Um, but, but certainly, I think, I think how you bring, and a, a GPs, you've mentioned primary care, can be quite um, skeptical sometimes about the, the use of their patient data. They certainly feel that they are guardians of, of patient data. And, and it really highlights to me the work that I've done, how very important it, it is to communicate thoroughly with all stakeholders, to have proper representation, um, because you can go, you know, innovation, technology, people want to move quickly. Uh, sometimes that's a mistake, really, if you find um, further down the line that if you left people behind um, and they're just not comfortable. So I think you need absolute transparency all the way through as to what you're trying to achieve and what the risks are. Um, yes, the NHS can be risk averse, but with good reason sometimes, you know. And industry, I think, need to be um, helpful in articulating those risks and being open and honest when they perhaps can't be fully understood or, uh, you know, it's a work in progress. I think we need a lot more honesty uh, and collaboration in, in, in um, you know, moving forward with technology. So just, just commenting on two parts of that. So the, the back office function efficiencies that could really help the NHS to then invest money elsewhere, I think, is almost a, a non-controversial point. I mean, technology is revolutionising all industries in terms of uh, what we might like to think of the simple stuff. It, it's not simple. We know that there's a lot of difficult uh, problems there and technological uh, hurdles to overcome. But you'll get very few arguments about, you know, kind of uh, streamlining finance processes and payroll. The NHS is a huge employer as well as being a, a service provider. Um, clinical decision support is a much more, uh, shall we say, uh, ethically difficult field. Um, and the comfort of having uh, a doctor or a clinician backed up by a, an effective tool, but with that safeguard of the clinician at the forefront, sounds like a sensible way to go. But what if that clinician is uh, given advice or however we want to describe the, the support that they're getting from the tool? And it leads to an adverse event. I'm conscious we've got two uh, legal brains, if I can describe you as such, on the, on the panel. So... Perhaps, Jacob, if you want to start off with, with that kind of dilemma. This is exactly the kind of area where existing legal regimes aren't necessarily going to be fit for purpose to deal with situations where artificial intelligence, and when I say artificial intelligence, I mean machine learning, neural nets, systems which are not necessarily predictable in advance. I don't mean an expert system where everything is pre-programmed into it, and so all of the choices that the system makes are chosen ultimately by a programmer. I mean systems which are making their own choices. And those are now some of the most effective systems for undertaking certain acts of diagnosis, looking at scans of cancers and working out whether the, there is a cancer there or not, these are already demonstrably better in some situations than even the top human experts. So we have a dilemma here. If you have what's known as a human in the loop, a human final decision maker who is looking at the outcome of an AI system and then making the final decision on that basis, if you have an AI system that is more effective than a human doctor in that situation on a percentage basis, then it may be the case that if the doctor thinks something is going wrong, in fact, it's the doctor that's making the mistake and the system is correct. And so the doctor is introducing error into that system. Now, that may be a choice that we are willing to make. That may be a trade-off that we are comfortable with as a society, at least at the moment. And I mentioned earlier about how people are often more comfortable with human decisions rather than, than AI ones. But that may not always be the case in the future. Generally speaking, the law attaches consequences to decisions made by humans. So if a doctor does something which leads to a mistake, which leads to a negative health outcome, 
there's a test called the Bolam test, which asks whether a reasonable body of medical people, it doesn't have to be the majority body, but if a sufficient number of other doctors would have done the same thing as that doctor, then the doctor will be considered safe. They, they won't be held liable, they won't be held responsible for that mistake. We just don't know how that would apply to an artificial intelligence system, which could scan all sorts of medical reports from around the world, which could in theory be much better than a doctor. So this is a real area where, in my view, we need to think about new parameters, new systems of governance to accommodate and to promote in a safe manner the new technology. Yes, I mean, I've got nothing to add to that. And I guess, um, you know, as soon as doctors start pushing for um, AI and themselves as part of their practice is a greater reliance on AI and they recognise that it can be a better decision maker, maker than their own uh, uh, capabilities, then we will see a cultural change. But, uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with Jacob. Is there, a, is there a risk in that, though, that most of that data from which that decision is derived is itself biased? Because it's created by all of us that are entering that data based on what it is we've been told. But actually, it might be that there's a future state which isn't based on that historical learning, but based on something that we don't even know about yet. Is that potentially a risk in taking that approach? I think that certainly is a danger of any use of AI. Um, most AI at the moment, as you alluded to, is dependent on the data which is fed into it. And there's a phrase, garbage in, garbage out. If your data that you're using is, is biased or inadequate, uh, or slanted in, in some way, which may not be obvious to the humans who are inputting it, then you may well lead to outcomes which are not the ones you want. So that certainly is an issue that you have to take into account when using AI to take medical decisions. But I think it's no more a, a medical issue than it is an issue in recruitment, in the decisions about giving people loans, where we've already seen there can be potentially biased decisions arising against various different groups. So it is something to be mindful of, but it, it, it's something across the board. Mm. It's an, an interesting debate. So it seems that there's a view that whilst AI can be more effective, more accurate than humans can be in certain situations and given the constraints of the data that goes in, we're just less accepting of mistakes that are automatic mistakes, if I can call them that, than we are of the fallacy of human beings, which uh, is something I guess we're all acutely aware of. But, it, but I, I guess the, the question comes back to legal recourse as well. So if there's an adverse if, event in a hospital and I know that the, uh, you know, the healthcare professional, and the, you have, often see this in the media where there's an angry family because of something that's happened, but does the responsibility lie ultimately with the, uh, the NHS trust, if that's who it is delivering the care, or with technologists? So, so does the tech industry need to get better um, and look at its own risk in terms of providing these algorithms that then are used to make decisions? Or are they kind of admonished at the point at which their technology is put into the NHS setting? With artificial intelligence technology, the decisions made by an algorithm will depend not just on the original architecture, which may, be, may have been designed by a third-party provider, as you mentioned, but also the data which is fed into them and the manner in which they're operated, the, the way in which the weightings might be redesigned or, or um, altered in a machine learning system in order to encourage or to discourage a particular outcome, for example, to correct for the kinds of biases that Sam was mentioning. So because of that dynamic nature of the way that these systems operate, they're not like a bicycle or a car which, once it rolls off the production line, essentially stays the same. They're constantly changing these systems. And so as a result, fixing liability and responsibility for when something goes wrong on a particular party can be really quite difficult. We can't necessarily use the same types of product liability regimes, which have previously been developed to deal with things like faulty drugs. So the product liability regime that exists at the moment was developed following the thalidomide scandal, whereas AI doesn't operate in that, in that manner. I think in, t in terms of if one of these issues were to come before the courts today, probably the outcome would be that you would look at 
who had assumed responsibility for the particular issue. It might be partially the NHS Trust, but it might be partially the uh, provider of the, of the software concerned. And you don't necessarily need to have one or the other being responsible. It might be that one was 60% responsible and one was 40% responsible. Ultimately, what a court is probably likely to look at are the kinds of systems that were in place to check for these sorts of results, the type of governance that can be, uh, and decision-making protocols that can be put into place in advance, even if you don't know exactly how things are going to play out in the future. I think in a world where we've now got new regimes on mass tort, where the dynamics of joint and several liability have now changed, I think it will also change the way in which clinicians practice when using this because ultimately it is a new type of technology compared to what we're used to. But it's not the first time we've gone through this. We've gone through a world where we've got new types of medical devices coming about, where that blend between software and device is much closer. And so already the boundaries have moved. And I guess it takes a new type of maturity in our system to deal with that. And an acceptance, there will have to be a new form of responsibility between product manufacturer, the user of it, the organization that takes responsibility for the patient. And I guess it's the risk assessment and then the insurance regime that follows. Because ultimately, we as clinicians will continue to try and get the best outcome for our patients great product manufacturers that provide even better products, but we're going to have a mature, we need a mature system that accepts that using these products will require a different type of governance. Thank you. Um, a question here, just coming back to uh, Slido and to the, the viewing public. Um, we had a question from Miguel. Um, I guess I'll start with you, Sam. He's asking about NHSX. Um, perhaps a premature question, but has NHSX looked at using not just AI technologies, but also the potential of blockchain? So uh, I think this is a really interesting area. And of course, the, the new technologies, whether it's distributed ledger, AI, machine learning, extreme reality and quantum computing are all those things, I think, that are still on the horizon, not just for us, but globally. These are still early days for NHSX and uh, our new chief exec is, of course, setting out our vision that we all uh, will work towards. But in the longer term, this type of technology in the round and its use in healthcare will continue to grow. And if we take something like blockchain around the world, there are really good examples of where blockchain is a type of technology, and it's a set of technologies, an umbrella term, a bit like AI, has been utilized. There's some things that it does better because the maturity is greater. There are other things which are much earlier for us in healthcare. And there are some good examples, like credentialing and staff identity, where blockchain has a fairly clear use case. There are others, like medical records, which will come much later on. And I think similar to AI, we're going to need guidance and policy and probably outside commentators to help push us on this subject. And I'm not sure if uh, Jacob uh, has a view on this, but uh, obviously like AI, it's something that's emerging. People must be questioning right now. I think all legal systems um, are social products. And as you quite rightly say, we, we need to make sure that, that those systems are fit to meet the technologies and the, the challenges which exist. It may be that certain things, certain rules can be adapted. And certainly one of the strengths of the English legal system is that we have certain basic rules which more or less have stayed the same for 50, 100 years and that gives um, consumers a great deal of certainty, it gives businesses and counterparties a great deal of certainty and that's one of the reasons why lots of places uh, have adopted similar rules to the UK. That said, we should be wary of becoming ossified and things like the Bolam test in healthcare and various other aspects of the legal system with AI and, and also with the other technologies you mentioned, it, it may be that those are no longer fit for purpose. And in that case, we need to look very carefully about how to reform the laws. Generally speaking, when reforming the laws, there's two ways of doing it. You can have judges doing it organically, or you can do it through legislation, through regulators, through a democratic process. My view is that with the new technologies, we need to have a democratic process. We need to have parliament and the regulators involved rather than just lead, leaving this to a case-by-case, judge-made basis, which leads to a lot of uncertainty in the short term. I think it goes back to something Anne mentioned earlier about transparency. Because if we can be transparent about the technology we're using, its use case, how it will be used, how the data will flow, 
ultimately that itself will generate trust, but will also allow people to make a decision as to where they want the needle to lie on this. And ultimately, something like blockchain is about trusted relations and transactions that require a degree of trust. There is like some form of contract between two entities continuously forming along a channel. And for that reason, it's the source of technology. And I can certainly see in healthcare globally, there are good use cases for this. The problem, of course, emerges when we have this discussion that becomes binary. It becomes whether we should use it or shouldn't use it. But actually, it's like anything else. It's an entire spectrum of technologies that require a more nuanced discussion around the type of technology that's suitable for a particular use case, where it will add benefit, and where that benefit could result in a better outcome for patients and the system overall. Uh, and I certainly look outside to other technology providers and what they're doing in this space, because it'll probably be a little while before we in the health service be ready to deal with something like blockchain. Thank you. Um, any more comments on the potential of blockchain, or should we move on from that particular B word um, and on to um, taking some more questions from here? So Zana Phipps um, says there's been a lot of talk on the panel about primary and secondary care. Um, what about the use of technology uh, and your views on the ambulance sector? I don't know if that's something that anyone has particular experience of. I'll start off on this. So urgency care, of course, as many people know, uh, is within my portfolio at the moment and digitization. Ignoring the sector, there is technology that could be used in any of those sectors, whether it's primary care, secondary care, community, mental health, ambulance, all of those. And in the ambulance sector in particular, they're dealing with um, urgency and the type of need is quite different. There's often a very high degree of clinical need, practical need. Emotional need, perhaps less so in that setting, but of course the individuals involved have an emotional need. And before perhaps we even get near the type of technology, we really have to define the type of need we're trying to meet. But in the ambulance sector, there's probably lots of things that we could do to help digitization, use of technology in that critical environment. Whether that happens to be the way in which an ambulance is dispatched through the system, whether it happens to be where that ambulance goes to, the technology that's used at a patient's side in terms of can it could a paramedic in the future treat a patient using some form of better uh, technology to help treat the patient there rather than conveying them? Or could it be that we're installing technology in an ambulance that allows certain activities to be undertaken there before the patient gets to in a hospital setting? All of these questions be answered. And if we look around the world, there is technology that's being used. If we take, for example, other countries, and I've seen it recently, uh, for example, from the US, from Mexico, from Israel, they're already using technology for their ambulance services at the point at which the, the CAD is being used. So this is the, the, the part at which, before the call comes in, and that's it's being used at that stage to even use technology to view a site where a patient might happen to be. But this raises a question about that data. If I can see a site, and I can see where that person is and everyone else there. How do we deal with consent in that environment? Because that image is being beamed about all those other people. But there are lots of examples where technology around the world has been used to optimize ambulance services. Great stuff. Uh, any more comments on ambulance services or we can move on? Moving on. Um, so there have been a couple of questions in top of the list on Slido. Uh, I'll combine with a, a question of my own, really, and it's around the, uh, the ability of SMEs to work uh, with the NHS. Um, so the, the question at the top of the list, really, is what would be an entry point for AI entrepreneurs looking to access NHS data? How does the NHS vet the startup or on, entrepreneur before allowing data access? So that's the first question. The second one really is the, so the, the tech vision um, released by DHSC and predating uh, NHSX, but very much informing their work, really kind of speaks to a, a plug and play type of tech landscape. So not kind of the huge monolithic systems allowing smaller, more innovative players to come in perhaps. Um, but do the companies themselves have a, the capabilities, and then B, the support from the system itself um, to use this data without running into trouble, whether that's legal trouble or ethical trouble, which then is a, a kind of PR uh, trouble as well. Anne? I think there are a number of potential um, 
difficulties, if you like, for SMEs to engage uh, with the NHS. And I think these have been problems for a long time, particularly around procurement. So there are very many instances when a competition will need to be um, run um, for a particular product, unless there are exemptions around some you know, innovation, some research. Um, but that in itself is a... Um, resource-heavy exercise that tends to favour the bigger organisations who have the strengths and depth and resources to demonstrate the requisite uh, compliance uh, and so on. Um, so I think that is difficult. Some changes were made to the um, procurement regulations a couple of years ago to try and encourage SMEs, but I think, I think the whole regime um, is still quite difficult uh, for smaller organisations uh, to access. Um, so I don't know if... There are other more practical um, obstacles as well, but that's certainly one we, we, we've seen frequently um, in, in terms of the NHS organisations being bound to follow certain regulatory procedures and engaging. I tend to find that we're really lucky that we have a buoyant market at the moment of lots of SMEs wanting to help the NHS. We have great instruments in place, whether it happens to be the existing acts or the guidance to implement those into the NHS, and especially dealing with issues like data, cybersecurity and privacy. Sometimes the interpretation of those that varies across the system, and that's both for the SME and also for the NHS partner that might be involved. So I totally accept that in many terms the procurement issues still exist, but it's what do we do with them next? So for example, if we take something like security, the issues that get conflated are privacy and security, which are two distinct things. But those SMEs might not have access to all the best advice. And on the other side, the NHS partner may not be taking all the right advice for them to work with. And you may have a great clinical team somewhere that have seen something, they want to try and use it, and think of it almost as some shadow IT that emerges and they're using this, this local piece of kit. And then it transpires that it doesn't necessarily comply with all the governance requirements that we need in the NHS. And so there is actually a fairly explicit regime of things that any provider, any SME would need to comply with, whether that's a big provider or a small one. And it's not actually that onerous in that one of those things is making sure that they, they adhere to the NHS Information Governance Toolkit, now the DSP Toolkit, that the staff they have working on them have complied with the right uh, training in terms of information security and governance, that they themselves are compliant around those requirements of cybersecurity, and that they also are clinically safe. And those things are all important. When we get right into the data part of it, that if they're transacting data, that it's stored in a certain way, uh, and that if they're sharing it, that there are agreements in place to share it. And these are fairly well-traveled lines around how these things come about. But the maturity on both sides and the degree of information that's available for both sides to make a meaningful decision isn't always there. And that's where we probably need to do much more about sharing different ways of working. And that's where I also see the benefits of sometimes a multi-vendor, pro-vendor approach where you might have a small SME working with a much bigger SME that has uh, at their gift all the sort of big cloud-based uh, you know, data repositories and things they could use that are already safe and offer them storage options and things that might help them navigate some of those things. Now, of course, there's rules in place for that. And there needs to be a better way of working. But I certainly see that to avoid some of the obstacles and the barriers, but to stay and or act within the rules, both for us in the UK, but also within the NHS, that could be a new way of working. And that sort of multi-vendor, uh, pro-vendor type model could be something we see emerge. And I already know that lots of people use cloud services to host some of these things that provide that security, that safety, and that privacy that they may not otherwise be able to maintain themselves. Yeah, I think um, from what I've seen, there is a growing opportunity to allow smaller organizations to engage with, with things like the NHS because of, of what you've mentioned, the idea that there can be now toolkits that are used across the NHS that are compliant, they're, they're monitored, and they can provide a way of, of ingress for smaller organizations, whether that means new approaches to de-identifying data or to obfuscating data, whether it means new approaches to preventing the loss of data and monitoring where data is. I, I think that going forward there are going to be increasing opportunities to start to share data when you need to in a secure safe and useful way um, i don't think it i don't think we're there today but certainly i see across multi vendors across small medium and large organizations uh, a real drive for everyone to get to a point where there's a kind of clear channels for communicating the data as it's needed when it's needed for the people who need it and for the people who can use it for innovation i think we'll see more of it and it, perhaps it goes back to transparency that Anne uh, mentioned earlier, because if everyone's transparent about what they're sharing, why they're sharing, and what the business need is, it might become a little bit easier to do this. 
Thank you. and to collectively yeah. identify the risks as well. I think NHS will struggle sometimes to actually identify what the risks are and they need help um, from suppliers and others to do that. So I think more of a collaboration, a transparent collaboration um, and being able to affect that would certainly help. And uh, Anne, Sam, Sam spoke about a compliance regime that isn't too onerous in terms of what you need to comply with. Does, does that reflect the views you get from clients that you work with and that you advise? Um, well, I think, I think if we go back to the question, are SMEs capable, do they have the capability to do it? When I, th I, think, I think Sam's absolutely right. You know, if you delve deep enough, if you, if you have enough access to the right advice, you can clearly identify what you need to comply, uh, comply with and, and so on. So I don't think that should be a particular um, hurdle. Um, but I do find, I, I think going back to the point about um, procurement, it is very difficult, I think, to get the sort of engagement that Sam was talking about, particularly before any opportunities advertised or something, to really get the sort of dialogue going that could help SMEs are quite restricted on that. So if we can find a way, uh, if you like, of, 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 of working together with SMEs to get the market ready, if you like, where, whether that doesn't create a risk for a, a, a buying NHS organisation, I think that would be extremely helpful. And one thing I've certainly seen from some of the various things I've been to is that discussion between SMEs and other providers out there has resulted in knowledge transfer and sharing that has been to the benefit of the system. And there isn't really a commercial interest. There are different companies doing different things. But by that discussion that takes place, they can often share that knowledge. Although I would also accept, whilst I've said on the one side it's not too onerous, it's also not, in, it's not entirely easy. And in my personal opinion, uh, both as a clinical service provider and working in the system, I think there are things we could do to make it easier for any provider, whether it's an SME providing a digital system or whether it's a clinical service provider, there could be a better way of onboarding uh, a new SME so that during that process they comply with the different requirements. And if I think about how easy it is to sign up now with a bank or an online shop or use any sort of um, you know large uh, file sharing system it's not that difficult but why is it so difficult to engage sometimes with the NHS is there a better way that we could have an online platform that does some of these things for the individual engaging I think as well when you when you look across the system the AHSNs 15 AHSNs around the country they were um, kind of recertified if that's the right term with uh, a very clear remit to help companies within their geography, so the whole of England is covered, um, to work with the NHS. Could we uh, envision a, a service perhaps working with the AHSN so that wherever you are in the country, we don't just want a, a London-based health tech industry, uh, where companies can get access to advice um, so that they can access data to make their solutions work, to develop, test, uh, and progress their solutions? I think ab absolutely. And I, I, and I think there are some examples, I think in Oxford, for example, <coughs> uh, through the HSN, uh, of working closely with smaller suppliers and the um, acute hospital mm -hmm. to do exactly that, to sort of trial new ways of working uh, and using the um, trust um, assets, including data assets. Obviously, uh, you need to have some caution around that and the issue of liability, of course, for um, is one that needs to be worked through. But I think there are examples of that sort of working, which is clearly a, a way forward. I think the academic health science networks are a great network um, and it's quite unique that health service in the world has anything like this where they're investing in uh, part of the system to help drive innovation. But innovation itself is so broad. It's everything from technology and digitization on the one side through to clinical products and services. So that means it's quite difficult for every one of those HSNs to provide all that knowledge and information to every single supplier that comes along, hoping that it's delivered in a consistent way to get the best outcome. So I certainly see a space one day in the future where for digital and technology that has no boundaries, that is boundaryless, whether it happens to be across the world or happens to be even within England, we probably need another way of servicing the needs of those SMEs to make it easier to understand how to navigate the system. Now, some of those HSNs are working together right now to help that. 
But we do need to move away from a place where it might be an SME that has deep pockets and therefore it can lobby at the doors of lots of HSNs and get in and others that aren't, don't have the ability to do that. We need to create a much more of a sort of level playing field for those SMEs, which at the moment may not necessarily exist across the system. So the HSNs are excellent conceptually, but in a digital world, for digital and technology SMEs, we definitely need a slightly different approach. And we need it much e make it much easier f through an innovation platform-based approach they can plug into the system so that it's much clearer to them what they need and to us in terms of what problem they're solving for us. There's one good example from uh, another area which the NHS might draw on, and I know a lot of people have uh, spoken about this in the past. That is the FCA, that's the Financial Conduct Authority, the um, organisation which regulates the financial industry in the UK. They have for financial technology, fintech, a sandbox which allows new market entrants and existing market entrants with a new product to test out their products in a safe environment which allow both them and the regulator to understand what the implications are and what the likely results are going to be if their system was to be rolled out on a wider basis. There has been empirical research into this which has demonstrated that it actually benefits SMEs greater than it does the major players in the industry. And I think one of the reasons for that, it goes back to what was being mentioned earlier by Anne, which is the difficulty that SMEs have in accessing the kind of advice, accessing the types of lobbying structures, the individuals involved in achieving regulatory uh, sign-off. Having a sandbox allows one to, in a, in a sense, short circuit those types of systems by simply putting your products before the regulators and allowing them to see it. So that may well be something that, if the NHS isn't using already, it could be a valuable tool in the future. I'll return to uh, Slido. So we've got a question here, a, a niche one, I guess, within the medical device space. But um, does the panel agree that the recent MHRA guidance around what constitutes a medical device is an inhibitor to the adoption of AI and innovation in the NHS? Sam. So I haven't seen the, the detail of it, but I am familiar with the MHRA guidance on this. So I don't think it's necessarily an inhibitor, but I suppose it's going to come down to interpretation. Ultimately, MHRA comes out of statute, out of regulation, and that's an interpretation of how that they're going to need to implement that and what it might mean for AI. But AI is an umbrella term. It's got three different components to it, largely speaking. And so for some of those, they might well fall into the lower category of device regulation. And for some of those, they might end up falling to the higher degree of device classification. And ultimately, it will depend on which decision is being made based on the type of AI that's being used for that medical device. But if we take AI, I mean, Jacob will have a view on this perhaps, but it's a broad subject with lots of different components to it. And it's probably not possible to have one set of guidance that results in one set of outcomes. I think that's right. It AI is not a term which has a shared definition, and so when one person talks about AI and another person talks about it, they might come at it from completely different uh, perspectives. So whilst the, de the, the definition of uh, medical devices might be fit and suitable for certain types of technologies which are described as AI, it might be more difficult with others. The ones where I do see the current re regime for medical device regulation as being a slightly difficult fit with AI is the technologies that are making dynamic, unpredictable decisions, so machine learning, neural nets. Where you have that type of decision making, that is much more, to me, like medical advice. It's much more, uh, it's much more similar to the way that human doctors advise people on their medical outcomes and diagnose issues. That's really rather different from a situation where you have a, a medical device which is simply fulfilling a, a set of pre-programmed uh, uh, instructions, and that, that would be an expert system or symbolic AI, good, good old-fashioned AI. Those types of things are much more like standard devices. But where you have a device which learns, which changes, which adapts, which evolves, that is much more like a human, and I think we may need to think quite carefully about how we regulate those and whether the medical device regulation as it stands needs to be updated. We've had a, a couple of questions on Slido about the, the quality of NHS data. So 
We've spoken quite a lot about AI and what it can do with data, but there's a reliance on good quality data. Have the panel got any comments on uh, how problematic it might be when these tools are unleashed on uh, what is, I don't want to say a dirty data set, but particularly once you bring in social care, not a lot of this data is easily machine readable. So I could speak from my past experience um, working with dirty medical data, and I've, I've often found this frustrating because I've often found that it's not the data that's not clean, it's that reality is complicated. So there may be missing data that's missing for a good reason because a reading couldn't be taken. It's not, I, say to, I think to call it dirty data kind of minimizes what's actually happening, which is that human beings are extremely complicated. So I, and I could be wrong and you may disagree, but I think you'll never reach a state in medicine where data will be clean because humans will always be complicated and they'll never be You'll never get perfect, clean data without missing information, without information that seems out of, out of the realm of possibility. Um, but it is possible to design systems that detect and mitigate against low quality data. Um, and certainly, it would be part of any kind of system designed to have that as your, one of your, your first exercises to see how, how high quality this data is. But I don't think you should say, we can't use a new technique because the data is low quality. Because the data may be low quality because genuinely, the world is, is complex, and we should work with data we have and make the best decisions possible. I think we should think of data as a commodity. It's an asset. And like any market in an asset, it may always be, it will be imperfect. The perfect market doesn't really exist, and I don't think perfect data will ever exist. But the data will be optimal for what it was ever designed for. Now, some of that might be in a paper format. Some of that might be in electronic format of some kind. But it will vary depending on the circumstances, the maturity of the model, and, and those things. So in time, if there is a really good use case and a need we're fulfilling by using that data, that in itself might drive the improvement of the quality of that data as that particular thing is utilized, whatever it happens to be. The other side of it is, though, do we need to think about the way in which we pay for health services so that we value the data that we have? And against that value, we might pay for quality in that data. Now, initially, that might be a soft touch regime. In the longer term, it might need to be a bit more formalized. But like any other sector, I go back to whether it's retail or financial services, they valued the data and the benefit they derived from that data. And in doing so, they got the best data over time, which made, made better decisions that ultimately benefited that industry. Thank you. I think I'll, I'll summarize those comments as the data isn't dirty, but humans <laughs> are. So, <laughs> Thank you. Um, we are coming to the end of the session now. So um, thank you very much, all of you, for attending. Um, I'll, I'll just invite Sam if you've got any closing remarks at the end of this panel. I think this is probably very much the start of a discussion on data and digital transformation. We've got a lot to learn from other sectors and our own. We've got to take very seriously patient safety, privacy, security, but also how we adopt emerging technology, whether that happens to be AI or new technology, how we use the cloud, and how we make the best use of the advice that we can take on risk in the system. I'd really like to close by thanking uh, yourself, Ben, and Tech UK for supporting this, Google, yourself, Jacob, and uh, DAC Beechcroft San uh, for joining us today, and most of all, of course, Atos and Google for helping ensure that this event could take place. Um, wishing you all the best for Digital Leaders Week, and uh, thanks for your support. Thank you all, and we'll, we'll look forward to the launch of NHSX in a, in a couple of weeks' time. You can't launch a government body without great announcements, so we all look forward to seeing what's coming out of your early prioritization. Thank you.